Um, hope it was a pleasant journey all the way to Ampang this morning. So um, before we start, I would like to give simple housekeeping rules. This is the auditorium of Hospital Ampang. Maybe I would appreciate if uh, we kindly keep keep the maintenance of the auditorium at all times. Our washroom and toilet is over, go out, turn left, turn left, in front of the library, male and female. The surau for praying later during lunchtime, go out, turn right, over the right side. So those who haven't registered or claimed your sweet goodie bags, you can find me later. And also a QR for the MME as well. Uh, if you haven't scanned, also fi kindly find me or my fellow colleagues later. Um, yeah, so before we get started, I would just like to make a simple introduction to our first speaker of the day, Dr. Iskandar bin Khalid. He will be giving a uh, basic cardiorespiratory and recipe physiology. So he's from HUKM with 13 years of experience in this medical field. His special interests include regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine, perioperative point of care ultrasonography, enhanced recovery after surgery eras pathways and out of the numerous awards he has obtained he also recently just won the 2019 anesthesia and critical care academic excellence award from national university of malaya so without further ado let us uh, welcome dr iskandar i run this i run good morning just give me one second yeah Okay, uh, and good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction. So, <clears throat> good to see all of you here. Uh, so, today I've been invited to speak on this course eh, for medics and MCAI, so talking about basic cardio and recipe physiology. Lah. So, just before I start, just with a quick show of hands, how many of you are planning to take medics? Show of hands, okay. And then MCAI, how many are planning to take MCAI? Okay, all right, you. <laughs> okay, so just get into it because there's a lot to cover, no disclosures. Okay, I'm from HU Campus. Uh, Madam MCS introduced me just now. Most of my work is in anesthesia. Of course, I do other things as well. <coughs> so I think most of you can find this document easily online. It is the scope for MEDEX. So there's going to be 60 SBA questions. And it's a W4 steps in a 90 minute exam. And then it's very focused, so it's good. If you're doing MEDEX, don't need to study other things, okay? Don't need to read about Imato and so on, but it's very focused. As for the MCI, of course, it's more, much, much, much more broad, okay? So the one, one or two of you take MCI. You should have seen this document right now, I suppose. So you know that the scope is much larger. You need to cover things like equipment and so on. So let's get into CVS Physio. Yeah? So these are the this is the scope, these are the things you're expected to know for MEDEX at least. Huh? Okay, and I'm sure you need to know this for MCI as well. So we're going to go through each of these one by one. Now looking at cardiac anatomy, I know you're thinking what what how much are you supposed to know at this point? Okay. The main thing is you know that there are two arteries, right? The right and left coronary artery. They rise from the coronary sinus. The left comes out and it breaks into the the left main stem breaks into the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. And then the right coronary artery bends around this edge. Okay, you have the posterior descending at the back. That's it. So what they like to ask in this kind of exams is this coronary dominance. So is which artery ends up becoming the posterior descending artery? So this one at the back. So most of the time, like in the diagram, you can see it's the right coronary artery, about half the time. 30% both. So the left bends around and see the left circumflex behind it, the anastomosis, and they both supply the PDA. And about 30% it comes from the left. And the other important thing is what artery supplies the SA node, AB node. So most of the time, the RCA supplies the SA node because you can see the SA node will be in the right atrium, right? So it makes sense. And then the LCA, 40%. And then because the AB node supply comes usually from the PDA, posterior descending artery, the right coronary artery supplies about 90%, and the LCA, 10%. 
So this one is something you do in your daily practice. Okay, you do a 12 ECG, and then from the 12 ECG, you decide which part of the, EC, of the heart is it looking at. Then telling you, is the elevation, is the depression, certainly, as you know, it corresponds to certain parts of the heart. Right? So this is something you need to know for your clinical practice and also commonly asked in exams. Okay? So we know that V1, V2 is usually the enteroceptor, V2, V4, enteroceptor. V5, V6 is looking at lateral. AVL and 1 is so lateral. Then 3, AVF2 is looking at inferior. And you want to look at the right side of the heart, you need to do a <coughs> right sided ECG. Okay? So Venus also comes out quite often in space and MCQ because people usually don't read it. So mainly, you just need to know three things. There is a coronary sinus, which is most of the venous drainage. It is a combination of its four veins, four or five. Veins, okay, I put five right now, but because it depends on which book you read. The important thing is what is not in the coronary sinus, but that's usually the SBA. Okay, the following, you know, are uh, directly drained into the heart. So the coronary sinus, anterior cardiac vein, and the tabasin vein, these all directly drain into the heart. The special thing about tabasin is they drain into both sides of the heart, the right and the left side. So they constitute part of the shunt. Okay. CVP waveform, again, no, no one really looks at CVP, CVP much anymore, but it's still a very popular exam question. So you need to know what each peak and valley means. So it's A, C, X, B, Y. So A wave is the atrial systole. C wave is doing the contraction or the ventricle. The tricuspid valve apologies words, right? So the X descent is as the right ventricle contracts, it pulls the AV valve down. The tricuspid valve down. Okay, so what happens is the volume in the right atrium increases, so the pressure drops. So you have that X descent, the X value. And V is when the tricuspid valve closes, the right atrium fills up against it. And the Y descent is as the tricuspid valve opens, there is passive filling or filling of the right ventricle. Excuse me. Okay, any questions so far? So go a bit fast, but if anyone has questions, just oops, just ask them. Okay, cardiac cycle again, very popular as big questions. So how are they going to ask you? They're going to ask you with this phase, these things happen. So one of it is real, the other three are wrong. Lah. Okay, so there are five phases there's the isovolumetric contraction, which is the first phase. Ejection phase, IVR. So rapid and slow filling is you can combine both, you know? and then finally back to the atrial contraction. So one, two, three, four, five, then back, to, and then atrial contraction. I think it's six phase, sorry, not five. Huh? <coughs> so the important thing is here you go phase by phase. So let's look at IVC, yeah? isovolumetric contraction. So what happens here is whenever it's isovolumetric, what does it mean? The volume doesn't change. So it means all the valves are. Closed, right? The aortic valve is closed and the mitral valve is closed. That has to happen here, right? At the start. So at the end of the contraction for ejection to occur, which valve has to open? The aortic valve has to open right? for ejection to happen. Okay? So looking at the first slide, okay, you need to know the valve closing opening. You also need to know the pressure. So the blue line, which is the LV pressure, will of course rise because the LV is contracting, but no volume change is happening. So if you look at this line, so volume, the volume is the same. The volume in the heart is the same, right? Isovolumetric. Mm. And if you look at the ECG, this is usually the peak of the heart complex, the okay, PRS complex, and the first heart sound, which is the closure of the valve. Follow? So during injection, as the aortic valve opens, so the LV pressure continues to rise, but because the aortic valve is opening, the LV pressure transmits to the aorta, this first line. So as the pressure is transmitted, the aortic pressure will rise as well. So important thing is, LV pressure is higher than the aortic pressure because pressure, the flow needs to be forward, right? That's what this picture is trying to show you. So because of the opening of the valve, the volume drops. Do you see? Mm. And the
we need to relate to the human. Okay, repolarization. Okay, this is when the ventricles are starting to repolarize. All right, so you get isobotomic <laughs> relaxation. So again, the valves all to be closed. This periodic valve closes. This produces a second heart sound. Okay, and as the valve closes, it produces this refract reflection. It's bounce, known as the what is this thing? Dichotic notch. Okay, it's related to the closure of the aortic valve. So you have this dichotic notch, can you see? The aortic pressure wave bump. So our first ventricular pressure bumps. Right? And now you have rapid feeling. So do you rapid feeling? It's called rapid feeling, but it does most of the feeling. Right? So it's called rapid feeling. Right? And then you have a slow feeling phase. So all this is passive. Passive meaning nothing is contracting. The atria is not supporting. It's just passive feeling into the ventricle. And sometimes you might have a third heart sound here because if you have a stiff ventricle or heart failure, and finally we get atrial system. So the other waveform to pay attention to is the CVP waveform. If you just covered the last slide, can you see the CVP waveform here? So atrial contraction is the middle of the atrial system. It's just after P wave. Remember, electrical phenomena have to happen before mechanical. So we need the P wave first here, followed by the atrial contraction. And you notice here, the volume increases abruptly. So this is active. So this part of feeling is passive. This is active. Because the atria is contracting. So what do you call this thing? Anyone? We call it a little bump here, giving the atrial system. Let's call the atrial kick. So when does it become important? Yeah. Probably won't ask you that next slide. So when you have situations where the feeling is bad, where the feeling is less than expected, the atrial kick becomes important. The other patients might do stenosis. The patient did the diastolic dysfunction. So the LV is not feeling passively well. So you need the atrial to contribute more. Okay. So normally it's very small, about 20%, but it becomes important in this condition. Okay. Anyway. So the thing then starts over again. Lah. So again, very popular question. We ask you the face and what happens. So you need to know what happens. Don't forget ECG and heart sound. One of the stem is going to be ECG. Right? And yeah, uh, for this, for this, this slide is going to take a picture. I'll share the slides. It should be six minutes. I think because I combined the feeling with your Okay, so when we talk about myocardial performance, what is a heart's job? Pump. Right? And how do you know the pump is doing well? It produces a cardiac output. So you look in cardiac output. So that's the definition of cardiac output. So we all know the normal is about 5 liters per minute, okay, or 70 minutes per kilo. And we know that during exercise, if you are fit, you can increase to about 25 to 30 percent or more. Okay, but the value you want to remember is that okay, you can increase not around 30 percent, 25 to 30 per minute, so five to six times higher. And we must know this equation because whenever they ask you what determines my kind of performance, the determinants are this heart rate and stroke volume. Heart rate and stroke volume determines the output. So stroke volume is determined by Period, contractility, and after. So what is period? So this definition is something you have to try to process a bit. It is the ventricular myocardial sarcomere stretch at the end of diastole. That means when diastole ends, how stretched are the myocardial? So how filled are they? Okay, how filled are the ventricles at the end of diastole? Right? So the main determinant is venous return. So you know they are myocardial they're made up of all the sarcomeres, sarcomeres they are the type of striated muscle. So how stretched the sarcomeres is will tell you how much payload they are. So if they are very stretched, you have a lot of volume, hypovolemia, they will be increasingly stretched. Yeah, and vice versa. If it's hypovolemia bleeding off, they will be less stretched. Okay, so we have less payload. So increase venous return, increase freedom. So how you increase venous return? Hypovolemia, venal constriction. For example, you start a vasopressin. So, Adrenaline, you do not refrain. 
Und welche sensible Tabletts gibt man nicht? So, K in Seite, so von V noch mal switchen. We have negative pressure ventilation, it creates like a bar. You suck the venous return into the heart. Okay? That's negative pressure ventilation. So the opposite will be different. Like hypovolemia, we do dilatation, like spinal, sepsis, and so on. PPV, high IAP, you know, more peritoneum, and all peritoneum, peritoneum, peritoneum. All this will reduce venous return and reduce pressure to the heart, and reduce the cardiac output. So, how do we measure preload clinically? The best way is end diastolic volume, because that is the amount that will decide how stretched the ventricle is. But it's not easy to measure volume, so another way is to measure end diastolic pressure, which is also not easy, because you will need like a cardiac catheter or fluid catheter. But that is the best way. So the relationship between preload and stroke volume is represented by what we call a Frank Starling curve. So this is a Frank Starling curve. On the x-axis, you have end diastolic volume, or x-axis, you have stroke volume. So as the end diastolic volume increases, as the preload increases, the stroke volume increases, right? So normally we are around here, where the EDV is about 140, stroke volume is about 70. That is why you get EF of about 50%. Okay, 70, 140. Now, notice one thing is in the more normal people, there will be a point where it flattens out. It doesn't go up forever, can <laughs> Anyone you want to know why? Why does it flatten out? Because the ventricles are maximum, the subcopia is maximally stretched. So there may be a point where when you stretch too much, you no longer have an increase in the postural contraction. This is about 2.2 micrometers. I'm not sure they need to know, but for my purpose, you okay? So what is the Frank Starling law? Frank Starling law says that stroke volume of the LV will increase as the LV volume increases. Because of the minus side stretch. So the more stretch it is, the more forceful the contraction. So when we talk about contractility, we're not talking about this. This is when we're talking about preload. Okay? Understand? This one means more preload, stronger contraction. But that's not the same as contractility. Contractility is like when you give adrenaline and the heart contracts faster, harder. That's another thing we're going to cover later. So remember, Frank Sanyo is talking about the relationship between preload. And cardiac output, not contract into the cardiac output. So you can see here what I was explaining earlier. In healthy people, there'll be a point where the sarcomere cannot be stretched anymore. So as the preload increases, the volume will increase. But if you have heart failure, this will happen, it will drop down. That's why patients with heart failure, when they get overloaded, right? They do not uh, comply with the institution of fluid and so on. This happens, they go into heart failure because the sarcomere is overstretched. Understand? That's why we do to smile and all. So, this is the other thing contractility. No, this is not the same as Frank Starling uh, mechanism or not. The so contractility is an intrinsic ability of my heart to contract. That means the heart rate, preload, and afterload is fixed. It doesn't change. So, these are other factors. So the heart contracts, that is what we call contractility or anemotropy. And it's determined by how much calcium is there in the myocyte. So the myocyte brings calcium inside. Oh, we don't need to know in detail, but at least know this. Calcium is brought into the myocyte. The more calcium it is, the higher the contractility. So things which can increase calcium are SNS stimulation, sympathetic stimulation, pain, anxiety, and all this. Inotropes, detoxin, tachycardia. Things we reduce calcium will reduce contractility. So when you give propofol, thio, gas, all this will reduce the calcium in the myocyte. Hence, you have negative inotropy. That's why you're making drop. And patients with myocardial ischemia heart failure, the same thing. So what is, remember just now, uh, EDV, EDT represent preload. So contractility is best represented by DT over DT. This is change of pressure, rate of pressure increase in the ventricular cavity during isobolytic contraction. Why? During IVC, all the other factors are not, the, because all the valves are closed. So preload is not affecting, afterload is not affecting. We're only looking at contracting. So if you look at the arterial line waveform, you can actually tell by how steep the upstroke is. If it's very steep, okay, this contractility is high. But if it goes down, the steepness 
Let's eat this particular TV dish. So if you eat this particular thing, and we found this is something you can tell. If you look at the Frank Starling curve, remember, don't get confused. Frank Starling law is preload versus high output. So this Frank Starling curve shows preload versus high output. But what happens when you change the contractility? You have a new line. Remember this now. Kalau you change the preload, you are on one line. Kalau preload increase, you move along the line. Kalau preload decrease, you move along the line. Okay, mm. the same line. Right? At some point it's flat, at some point it's not. But when you increase contractility, you create a new line. So this is increased contractility, increased anotropy. Kalau you start as a medium efficient go, you go to mean, go to mean, go. This is reduced contractility. If you give gas or high gas standards. Afterload is just what the heart has to push against. Essentially, yes, but it's not just the systemic circulation. It's everything the heart has to push against, including the heart itself. Okay, when the heart wants to pump up blood, it has to push against its own wall. It has to push against the valves. It has to push against the aorta, against the whole body. So all that accumulates into what we call afterload. So it's not just systemic vascular resistance, that's just one component. So it's defined as tension generated in the wall to eject shock volume in the system. Tension is the stress that the wall has to push against. Why do we put it on bypass? This, by putting it on bypass, you reduce the afterload. Reduce the afterload, you increase the cardiac. And you try to reduce the SVR so you can do that. So, you know, release the tonicate or treat pain, uh, don't put the vasopressor too high, and so on. So, what represents afterload? The problem is there is no good representation. So, we use SVR, but like I said just now, SVR alone does not fully explain afterload. There's many other things. Example, you have aortic stenosis, your SVR doesn't decrease. But your afterload does. So you understand. Okay, SVR is just one component of afterload. But because we don't have a good way to measure it, we still use SVR. We also use MAP. Again, not a good way to measure it. You can have normal BP, but you can have aortic stenosis. Right? So it's just an index, just a rough guide. There's something called dynamic arterial elastance. So those of you who have seen those cardiac output monitors, flow track, acumen, and all this, you know? Have you seen this cardiac output monitor is using IC? No? Okay. It's okay. Yeah, just, just be aware that there are more advanced indexes like this, but they're not easily available. You need to have very special equipment cardiac output monitors to measure. So again, looking at the Frank Starling curve, it's easy to remember that when you have afterload changes, it's the opposite of inotropy changes, contractility changes. So if you have reduced afterload, it shifts a new curve to the left and up, and vice versa. So it's the opposite direction of contractility. Okay? Understand? Remember just now, contractility increase, shift left. Decrease, shift right. But afterload is the opposite. Okay? You okay? Right. <coughs> so looking at it, in summary, for the heart to perform its job, which is to produce a cardiac output, the factors are stroke volume and heart rate. Preload, increased preload will increase it. But remember, there'll be a point where it is maximally stretched and it doesn't. And in some people, color heart failure, too much preload will actually reduce the stroke volume, right? Because of the curve drops down. Contractility also increases stroke uh, cardiac output. Afterload does the opposite. Okay? It reduces cardiac output. Any questions so far? No. Okay, so this is another big important concept to understand. When you talk about cardio, essentially, as an anesthetist, you want to ensure supply is more than demand. That's it. Simple, right? The economy. So you want to make sure that throughout surgery, in the post-op, you want to make sure oxygen supply is more than oxygen demand. If the supply becomes more than demand, everything is good. But if the demand becomes more than supply, you get ischemia and you get MI, you get ECS. So what are the factors which affect supply? Two things. 
how much blood flow there are going through the coronary arteries and how much oxygen there is in the artery. These two things. And what determines demand are mostly those factors we covered just now. The determinants of my cardiac performance. So you have a higher heart rate, more demand. Higher contractility, more demand. Higher afterload, more demand. Easy. So there's only one thing missing here, right? Which is preload. So preload is a very small factor, but it can also increase demand. I didn't include it because it's a very minor factor. These are the main factors. So let's break them one by one. So when you talk about supply, the blood flow is important. So blood flow is about 250 mL per minute, 5% of rising cardiac output. So if you know about Ohm's law, you know flow is proportional to pressure difference over resistance. So what determines the flow to the coronary arteries is the upstream pressure, which is your aortic pressure, pressure in the aorta, which is your systemic VP. Lah. And the downstream pressure, which is the pressure in the ventricle. The coronary vascular resistance is the other factor. So the thing to remember about the heart is oxygen extraction ratio is 70%. That means whatever oxygen entering the coronary arteries, 70% will be removed. This is unlike other organs in the body. Other organs in the body is about 20 to 30%. So what is the clinical implication of this? That means when the heart needs more oxygen, needs works harder, like exercise, ischemia, it can't extract any more oxygen from the blood. So what does it need to do? It needs to increase the coronary blood flow. Okay? So usually what is, how it does it is by reducing the resistance. When it reduces the resistance, the coronary blood flow increases. Okay? Whereas other organs, they can extract more oxygen. They can take up more oxygen from the blood because it's only 20-30%. Not much buffer. It's just uh, it's already serious. Okay, so you can see the determinants are aortic pressure, which is a VP, ventricular pressure, which is different between systole and diastole, I'll explain later, and the coronary vascular resistance. So what can affect this? You have physiological factors, you have autoregulation. Autoregulation means that the heart can do the job itself. It does not need any other systems like your autonomic nervous system to be involved. So metabolic means that color oxygen is low. The heart will vasodilate, the coronary artery will vasodilate, resistance will drop, and the blood flow will increase. That's what we mean by metabolic autoregulation. You have all these mediators which will cause vasodilation. Automatic nervous system have a very small role. That means sympathetic and parasympathetic don't really affect coronary blood flow, but sympathetic does increase aortic pressure. We know that color sympathetic right? systemic BP line, right? So we'll increase the upstream pressure. And viscosity, something else to remember. Color patient's HP is 10. By increasing HP to 15 or 20, can you actually improve oxygen supply to the heart? The answer is no, because of increased viscosity. If you make the blood too thick, too viscous, it'll actually reduce the blood flow. That's why the optimal HP is what is normal, huh? about 10 to 12, like that. And we don't have to go higher than that. And you have pathological factors such as atherosclerosis, like here, thrombosis, and volus versus pathos. Any questions for this slide? Yeah. So when you look at the myocardial oxygen supply, remember that the ventricular pressure is one of the factors. But there is a difference of ventricular pressure during systole and diastole. We know that during systole, the LV pressure is 1, systole, 120. Okay, that is your systolic VP. Okay, then the pressure drops during diastole. Right? So because of that, this is your aortic pressure. This one is from the cardiac cycle, the same waveform. Can you see? When you see still the pressure goes up because the aortic valve open here. Then the aortic valve close. You have a diacrotic notch and then the drop in pressure. This is the aortic pressure we form. So you look here, this is the left coronary artery flow. So during systole, the left coronary artery flow drops. 
almost to zero. Do you see that? So why is that? That's because during systole, because the LV pressure is so high, it reduces the blood flow from the equation in the last slide. Right? Aortic pressure minus LV pressure. So most of the blood flow in the left coronary artery is during diastole. Okay? Whereas for the right coronary artery, it's the other way around. Most of the blood flow is during systole, but diastole still has flow. So during most, during both systole and diastole, is, diastole you still have blood flow. So the thing to remember is diastolic time is inversely proportional to heart rate. So as heart rate increases, the diastolic time shortens. Mm -hmm. So the more tachycardic the patient gets, the less, the less blood flow goes to the left coronary artery. Understand? Yeah. But the, the same doesn't apply to the right heart. Right heart is throughout the cardiac circuit. Okay. So we covered coronary blood flow. Let's look at content. So this is the waste oxygen is carried in the blood, okay, in the capillary. We have oxygen which is bound to hemoglobin, about 98%. And then oxygen which is dissolved straight in plasma. So the oxygen content equation will show that oxygen bound to hemoglobin, this part of the equation. Oxygen dissolved in plasma, this part of the equation. This equation you actually need to know. It shows you how oxygen is carried. This part to hemoglobin, this part dissolved in plasma. If you put in all the normal values, you get about 20 mils of oxygen per deciliter of blood. That is normal. So, if someone wants to ask you what determines arterial oxygen content, it will be three things. Huh? Hemoglobin, saturation, and PaO2. If they ask you how to increase oxygen content, Increase these three things. Huh? Yeah. Either increase hemoglobin, increase SAO2, but or increase PO2. Yeah. But the caveat here is remember, although increasing hemoglobin can increase content, at some point it will increase viscosity, which reduces yeah. flow. Flow is just now coronary blood flow. Now we're talking about content. They both have to work together. Mm. Right. Right, so we covered this. Already, let's look at this. Yeah. Demand. Oh no, we very cut demand, sorry. So when this is more than this, it's good. Okay, so let's look at the cardiac conduction. Sorry, going back again. So this picture basically explains what you're going to do whenever there's ischemia. Example. Let's say you get patient in Baku at GA for lab. Uh, Anterior section, lah, okay, or hemicolectomy. Patient in Baku complain of chest pain. Okay, it was extubated, obviously. Send the Baku complain of chest pain. And then you see the ECG is ST depression. So, how are you going to improve? Now, so, there's this ischemia. So, how are you going to improve the situation? Anyone? Okay, okay, so yeah, SPO2 is 95%. So what can you do to improve the supply demand balance? Okay, so you can try to increase the content, right? So you're going to give oxygen to increase the SO2 and the PaO2. Later you will learn that, or hopefully you know that, you can increase it. How else can you increase SPO2 other than increasing the oxygen? Okay, yeah, you can increase the hemoglobin. So you check the HB. Color HB 7, 6, you transfuse. Lah. There's something else you can do, right? The other thing is you can try to shift the OHDC to the right. Okay? Oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay, later we'll cover that. So other than improving the content, you can also try to improve the coronary blood flow. So how do you improve coronary blood flow? What do you want to check? What do you want to do? Heart rate, good. So you check the heart rate. Say heart rate is 150. Bring it down. So you need to see what's the cause, huh? Is it pain? So give analgesia. Is it anxiety? Is it a tachyarrhythmia that you need to give some antiarrhythmia? Um, and so on. Yeah? So bring the heart rate down. Because heart rate affects both. Heart rate is the worst. Because the heart rate will increase heart rate will reduce blood flow and increase demand. It's the only thing which is on both sides. 
Good. So other than that, how else did you improve coronary blood flow? Good. Remember the upstream pressure is the systemic BP, aortic pressure. So you make sure the BP is okay. So you want to give a no add. You can start give final or start no adrenaline and so on. What else can you do? What else can you do to improve the blood flow? What about the coronary vascular resistance? How can you manipulate it? How can you reduce the vascular resistance? GTN, yes. Start GTN. Can you reduce the coronary vascular resistance? Yeah. Or something which is blocking the coronary artery. Is that increasing the resistance? So you can refer cardio, you know. Maybe there's a plug there. All right? That's it. So it all comes down to this. Whenever you have ischemia. So you should remember this forever. As long as you are planning to stay in this field, you should remember this. This is how you deal with ischemia. You're going to use this again for primary, for final, you know, as a specialist and so on. Okay, so there's a lot of te uh, technical terms, but uh, you know that the heart has a conduction system. So the important thing is they are intercalated this between the myocytes with this things, like things, dark things here. So there are three components. There are gap junctions which makes, makes certain the action potential will spread from cell to cell. So it, it allows the action potential to spread fast. There's a the fast hair adherence and desmosomes which basically mean that the cells are stuck to each other. So in summary, all the myocytes act as one, a functional syncytium. They contract together, which is important of course. So, Two types of cardiac action potentials because you have pacemaker cells such as the SA node and AVA node, and then you have the non pacemaker cell, which is the rest of your, your conduction system and your myocytes. Okay, your bundle of T's, the fibers, and your myocytes in the ventricle, and so on. So, the first type of action potential is this one the pacemaker potential. So, what is the most important thing you need to take from this is there is no resting membrane potential. That means during the so-called resting membrane potential, it is constantly depolarizing. There's no flat line. Because of this, this is a pacemaker. This property makes it a pacemaker. Because it spontaneously depolarizes. That's why we call it the pacemaker potential. The other non-pacemaker cells don't have this, just it's flat. This is phase 4, this is because these channels open, okay, the CN and T-type calcium. Then once you reach about threshold potential, your L-type calcium channel open, so you have depolarization. And at the top, they all close. In the potassium channel open, you have repolarization. That's it. So just three phases for pacemaker action potential. For the myocytes, non-pacemaker cells, they have five phases. So you can see phase 4 here, this is the resting membrane potential. So they are waiting for the action potential to come from the pacemaker. So when the action potential comes, you have depolarization, phase 0, rapid depolarization. Then you have partial repolarization because calcium channels open. And then you have this plateau, which creates this plateau phase. And then when the calcium channels close, you have the repolarization. So because it's plus two, it gives time. It gives time for the action potential to spread throughout the heart. It gives time for the heart to contract together. That's a sensitive. All right? You don't want to quickly repolarize that. You want to give time for the whole heart to depolarize. Understand? So five phases and the phase four is flat. It's the RMP. It's not spontaneously depolarizing. So because of this flat part, you have what we call the refractory period. And this is important because uh, there's two types, absolute and relative. So absolute means no matter what happens, what, no matter if there's a stimulus, uh, no matter how strong a stimulus is, you won't have another depolarization. That means, let's say the myocyte is here, then you have an ectopic uh, focus, ventricular ectopic, for example. It happens here. So it won't depolarize again. 
is refractory, it can't. Mm -hmm. so this is important because you want to make sure the ventricles can fill and to prevent fattening. Understand? You don't want the ventricles to depolarize again halfway. You want to have this refractory period. And there is a relative refractory period where if you give a very strong stimulus, you can still have depolarization. Any question? Ta-da! <coughs> so if you compare both, you can see a few differences. The pacemaker potential is much shorter, smaller in size. Okay, the, rest, the lowest point is much more positive or less negative. And the main thing is the phase 4. See, phase 4 is slope, phase 4 is flat. And three phases, this one has five phases. This one is very short because it just needs to create action potential. It does not need to, the pacemaker cells don't need to do any contraction. Whereas this one is long, it's what? Okay. So the heart is innervated by the autonomic nervous system. So this is how the sympathetic parasympathetic can affect the heart. You have sympathetic stimulation, it comes from the part of the brain known as the RBLM. So it goes through the cardioaspirator fibers, which is T1 to T4. Okay. These are people already dozing off, right? So T1 to T4, how is it clinically important? You see this when you give spinal. Mm -hmm. Right? When you give a high spinal, not give a high spinal, when you get a high spinal, <laughs> it goes up to T1, then you see bradycardia. Mm -hmm. Because of this. And that's where your sympathetic fibers come from. So when you have sympathetic stimulation, you have positive chronotropy, which is increased heart rate. Positive inotropy, remember just now? Increased calcium inside, increased contractility, increased cardiac output. Positive dromotropy. So dromotropy is speed of conduction, how fast the conduction goes along. So everything is positive. So overall, the heart will pump harder, faster. But for parasympathetic, you get negative chronotropy, you get minimal negative inotropy, not really a main factor, but you get negative dromotropy. So the heart pumps slower. Okay? So you see this. This is the pacemaker potential. We have sympathetic stimulation here. So you have this first three, which is normal. Sympathetic stimulation, can you see there's a difference? The slope of phase four. You see the slope is more steep. That is how the heart rate increases. That's how you get tachycardia when you get sympathetic stimulation. For parasympathetic, two things happen. One is the slope decreases. Another thing you get what we call hyperpolarization. So it goes even lower than before. So these two things combine to cause bradycardia. Okay? Let's take that. So cardiac output distribution again always comes up. So normally we have 5 to 6 liter per minute cardiac output increases by 5 to 6 times. The important thing for you to remember here is if you really cannot remember the percentage, that's fine. Okay, because you're not doing a secure viva, remember? You just need to know roughly a gaga. For most of the cardiac output goes to splanking, which is your GIT. Then kidneys, brain, heart is one of the least. It just needs 5%. But the take-home message here is during exercise, initially muscle is just 15%, but during exercise it can increase to 80%. Up to 20 liter per minute. So of the 25 liter, 80% can be to skeletal muscle. So the amount of blood flow to the other organs is the same, but the percentage decreases. That means during exercise, the amount of blood flow to the brain is still the same, but the percentage decreases. Ah, so this is the behavioral receptor reflex. So how does the heart cardiovascular system respond to hypo and hypertension? So there's three components. You have a sensor, which is the keratic sinus, huh? not the keratic body. The keratic sinus and the aortic arch barrier receptors. So these barrier receptors, they sense the blood pressure. So the important thing here is, when the blood pressure drops, the receptor activity is less. When the receptor activity is less, this, goes to the, this lower signal goes to the brain, there's less stimulation to the brain, this will increase the sympathetic outflow. So it goes to the effectors. So hypotension, less barrier receptor activity, is detected by the brain, the medulla. So the output goes to three parts. It goes to the 
Heart. So what what happens in the heart? I covered already. Increase heart. Increase. Chronotropy, inotropy, and dermotropy. It goes to the blood vessel. So you have vasoconstriction, which is artery, and you get venoconstriction, which is veins. And it goes to the kidneys. So it activates the RAAS, huh? any endotensive aldosterone system, which tries to keep salt and water inside to preserve fluid and salt. Right? So the opposite happens if the BP is high. So you get high BP, general receptor activity increase. They fire more. So there's reduced sympathetic outflow, more parasympathetic outflow. So the opposite happens. Okay, there's less outflow to the heart. So you get, you get parasympathetic outflow to the heart. So you get negative chronotropy, a negative dromotropy, a little bit of negative inotropy. There's less outflow to the blood vessels and the kidneys. So you don't get the constriction. You don't get the RAS situation. Okay? Mm. Understand? So this is the principle behind many things. So let's say you have a patient who is a patient. Okay, let's say you know the soldier who is uh, not soldier, the elderly man who suddenly gets up from supine position. Okay, like why none of you, not none of you, but why when you get up from supine to sitting or standing, you don't take sign? Because of this. Okay, as you suddenly get up, your blood pressure drops, but you have this reflex. We should increase the output to the heart and the blood vessels so your BP doesn't drop. Understand? It brings your BP back up. But an elderly person who has autonomic neuropathy, this very receptor reflex is impaired. That is why they don't have this response and then they get hypotension and they get syncope. Understand? Another situation okay? patients who are bleeding, hypovolemic, bleeding, so they go into shock. But initially, it's compensated shock because of this. Okay, because of the receptor reflex, it tries to stimulate the heart, stimulate the blood vessel, stimulate the kidneys, all to compensate for the hypovolemia. And vice versa. Patient with very high blood pressure, what happens? The opposite happens. You see a reflex very cardiac. Understand? So, Valsava maneuver, what do we use it for? To assess the ANS function, terminate arrhythmias, diagnose heart murmurs, and there's some surgery which needs Valsava, I'm sure most of you know. So, looking at each phase, the important thing here is to remember there are four phases short, long, short, long. Phase one and two is when you do the Valsava, that means you increase the ITP to 40. Phase three and four is when you release the Valsava. So in phase one, as you start the Valsava maneuver, ITP increase. So what happens is, all the blood in the lungs get pushed into the heart. Right? So because of that, there is increased venous return. So remember this now, if there is increased venous return, increased preload, increasing cardiac output. So the BP goes up. Because the BP goes up, you get reflex radicardia. So this is because of the barrier receptor just now. Okay, BP goes up, the firing increases, you have reduced output to the heart, so you get very bad. So as you maintain the Valsava maneuver, the high ITP in phase two, now the high ITP is preventing the venous return to the heart. Okay? So the preload reduces, the blood pressure reduces. There's a drop in BP. So this is sensed by the barrier receptor. So the opposite happened. The barrier receptor senses the fall in BP. It has to increase the heart rate to compensate. As it increases the heart rate to compensate, the BP picks up. Right? As the heart rate increases, the BP picks up. Understand? In phase three, you release the Valsava maneuver. So no more high ITP. So the opposite happens now. Suddenly the blood pools in the pulmonary circulation. So BP drops again. It's reduced venous return to the heart again. But the heart rate has no time to respond, so it continues to run. And lastly, phase four, as the because you release the ITP, all the blood is rushing to the heart, you have increased preload, increased cardiac output, the BP will overshoot. So this is sensed by the barrier receptor, so there's reflex. Ready cardiac. Okay? So just read this a few times. They're gonna how they're gonna ask your exam, of course, is during this phase, this happens. So, whether it's true or false. 
Okay, whether the what direction the heart rate of BP is going during the phase. Any question? No. Okay, last is shock. So shock is still inadequate tissue perfusion. So again, this is something you use throughout your practice whenever there is shock. Whenever you have, you have a patient with hypotension and you're trying to think of the causes, think of the four types of shock. So you have a patient, you know, in again in recovery, same patient, BP low, 60 or 40. You're trying to be, think of differentials. So first look at hypovolemic. Could the patient have black during surgery? They should be hydrated. So in hypovolemic shock, because of the reduced preload, you have to use cardiac output. Or did the patient develop MI causing a cardiogenic shock? Right? Or is it because a distributive shock, reduced SAR? So after a spinal or epidural bolus, maybe patient has sepsis, anaphylaxis, last but not least, obstructive shock. So obstructive shock is because you know things like tension pneumothorax, tamponade, and so on. Okay, all the embolisms. Okay. Any questions about cardio? Sorry if I'm going fast, but my next got to cover. <coughs> questions? No? Easy. <laughs> it's too, it's too easy.